So, I got this computer from the trash, garbage picked it if you will, and aside from missing front and side panel, nothing initially seemed to be wrong with it, so I took it home or sat in my basement for a few months. But I recently got around to checking out the system, and it was actually more powerful than I anticipated. First things first, it was originally an OEM machine, specifically the HP A6000 released back in 2007 with multiple variants and a starting price of $950. During my research, I sometimes confused it with the A6000N model, which was similar but did have a few differences. Either way, the the computer that I picked up was far from stock. It seemed that this computer originally shipped with a 2.2 GHz dual core AMD Athlon 4200 Plus, two 512 MB sticks of DDR2 memory, a 250 GB 7200 RPM hard drive, and no dedicated graphics solution. Instead, the graphics were integrated onto the Aspen MSI MS7548 motherboard, which had the ATI Radeon HD 3200. This was a bit different from the computer that I actually acquired, as this one had two sticks of DDR2 with a capacity of 1 GB per stick, an AMD Athlon 9 and, as per usual with recycled computers, no hard drive. These were actually some pretty solid upgrades from the original build with double the amount of RAM and roughly a 29% increase in CPU performance. So we were off to a good start, but after I turned on the computer to put a Windows 10 disk into the CD drive, a few issues quickly became apparent. First of all, whoever tried unplugging the SATA cable from the CD drive apparently didn't realize there was a locking mechanism securing the connection and ripped the entire SATA port out of the CD drive, leaving it attached to the cable. Initially, this seemed to be the only problem with the computer, so I just hooked up a different CD CD drive to install Windows 10 that way. During the installation, I did run into a small issue where the hard drive I used wasn't in the correct partition style, but it was nothing a minute and a command prompt couldn't fix. Also, I'd like to mention that during this entire setup process, the CPU fan was non-stop throttling all over the place. So I was a bit anxious and eager to hop into Windows and launch hardware monitors so I could check out the thermals of the system. And hey, while we're waiting for Windows to install, how about you go click that red subscribe button below because I put a lot of work into each and every one of my videos. Thanks. The Windows setup took about 10 minutes and the first thing I did was install Google Chrome, then Hardware Monitor. After launching the program, the processor seemed to be sitting around 55 to 60 degrees Celsius so I did a quick search on the safe temperature for the Phenom 9550. Turns out that that temperature was way over what was typical for the processor so I immediately shut down the system so I could replace the thermal paste. I made a few mistakes here. First, I didn't clean out the cooler, which I should have, but honestly, I didn't want my sink dirty so I just left it as is. Secondly, I actually broke the heatsink. I think that it was a mixture of incompetence and degraded quality, but when I tried reattaching to the CPU and motherboard, the plastic bit that locks it all down just broke. However, the thermal paste was already on and it was of good quality, so I said screw it, I'm just gonna run the computer as is. But before that, I installed an additional 4GB of RAM for a total of 6, an AMD Fire Pro V5800 graphics card, and a 500GB 7200RPM hard drive. I chose the Fire Pro V5800 since not only is it a decently performing graphics card, but also because it didn't require any additional power connections aside from the PCIe slot. When I eventually got to windows and check the temperatures, they seemed stable in the lower 40s and thankfully the CPU fan had finally stopped throttling. But after a while of running, these temperatures creeped up to the lower to mid 60s where they remained for the rest of testing. So the first kind of benchmark I ran in the system was trying to install all the softwares I'd be using on the system simultaneously. This included WinRAR, MSI Afterburner, Riva Tuna Statistics Server, Cinebench, 3DMark, Steam, and Epic Games Launcher. During all this, the computer never really slowed down or froze and I was impressed by how well the 12 year old processor was performing. After the installs were all said and done, I took a quick peek into Speccy to see how the temperatures were holding up. The CPU temperature rose from the 40s to the lower 60s while the motherboard was supposedly running at 100 to 103 degrees Celsius. Seeing this, I immediately shut down the system and gave it ample time to cool off. Looking back though, this was definitely due to a malfunctioning temperature sensor as this is by no means an operational temperature, and also that the temperature never really cooled off and was always sensed as such. While I was resting, I also remember that I had two more 2GB DDR2 memory modules lying around, so I swapped those out for the two single 1GB modules for a total of 8GB of RAM. Also, I plugged in a fan to the motherboard to try to lower these high temperatures, and I'd like to think that it helped. For this computer build, I tried to get as much power out of it for as cheap as possible as the idea was to upgrade an old office type computer to the point in which it could be used for gaming. The four 2GB sticks of DDR2 memory I got for free, but normally would cost around $15 to $20. The V5800 Pro I bought and installed for $15, but generally speaking, this car sells for a bit more, around $30 to $20, but I bought a pretty beat up version without a bracket in a near destroyed DVI port that I had to refurbish, so I got a bit of a discount. And finally, 
finally, the hard drive used in this system I bought for $10, all totaling out to a $55 hypothetical expense with the cost of RAM and the typical V500 included, but an actual expense of only $25. There is an issue with doing this though, risk that you run with such a small budget, and for this build it was the power supply. Compared to the original OEM configuration of the computer, the system was now running a higher wattage processor, four new and larger capacity sticks of RAM, and a dedicated graphics card. Now, the power supply for this system states that continuous DC output shall not exceed 300 watts, and after configuring the current build in a power supply calculator, the recommended wattage of the power supply ended up being 25 watts more than what was currently available. Overall, this isn't too big of an issue, but it does limit the components that I could potentially install into the computer. For the benchmarks of this build, all games are ran in a resolution of 1600 by 900 but none with VSync, even if I stated that I ran the game with all the highest settings applied. But with that a lot of the way, and the computer up and running, I began to benchmark the system. The first bit of testing that I did in this computer were all synthetic benchmarks, starting off with the Future Mark Firestrike test. With the proper drivers for the V5800 Pro installed, it scored a 1,402. From what I could see, this score was just wrong and performed nothing like another Fire Pro V5800 benchmark that scored 304. So I restarted an updated 3D mark, ran the test again, and got a score of 1,376, another invalid score. I don't really know what was the issue here, but if anyone has any suggestions, put them in the comments below. The last synthetic benchmark I did in this computer was of Cinebench R15. As soon as I started the benchmark, Mark, the CPU fan revved up to its maximum speeds and remained there for most of the testing. The Cinebench run took 4 minutes and 34 seconds and got a score of 150 CB. I couldn't find any Cinebench results with the processor at stock speeds, but I did find one where the processor was overclocked to a little over 2.7 GHz and got a score of 265 CB. This doesn't help much in regards to a direct comparison, but given that my specific build tends to run hot, we could at least expect that my processor's run on the benchmark would have received better results if it were ran on a healthier system. For the first gaming benchmark, I tried to run some Grand Theft Auto 5. GTA GTA 5 is well known for performing decently on weaker systems and is a very well optimized game so I expected some decent performance. When I launched the game though, a minimum recommended hardware check failure popped up stating that the CPU frequency didn't meet the minimum requirements. So anticipating a terrible performance, I ran all the settings at the lowest making the VRAM usage only 2 megabytes less than all that was available to the graphics card. But regardless of all the warning signs, the game actually ran pretty well. I played a bit of the opening story mission the average frame rate resulted in a solid 55 FPS. It wasn't flawless though and there were occasional bouts of noticeable screen tear during gameplay. Overall, the game ran great and Grand Theft Auto V is more than playable on this system. Fortnite, however, was a different story with a much different, worse experience. I let the game auto-detect which settings to use based on the system's hardware and it set everything to a mixture of medium settings while I set the frame rate to unlimited. With these settings, the average frame rate was 36 FPS, but something was terribly wrong with the game. At first I hoped that it was just a one-off thing, but I wouldn't stop clipping through the ground and only the low poly building and terrain models would load. So to try to fix this, I restarted the game, set the view distance to epic, set the 3D resolution to 100%, put every other setting on the lowest, and loaded into another solos match. This time the game just crashed, so I tried restarting it again, this time turning the view distance down by a notch. I was able to load in, and the game got an average of 32 FPS. But this didn't really do much, and only the low poly models would load, aside from players and vehicles. I then played some Minecraft on this computer, specifically version 1.16.1. Initially, I didn't have high hopes for this test, and ran all the settings at the lowest with 5 chunks. With this configuration, the average frame was 80 FPS, but the game would struggle and stutter while loading in new chunks. It was playable though, so I then ran the game with 10 chunks selected. This is nearly half the frame rate, but the struggling to load in new chunks stayed about the same. In either of these configurations, the game was still very playable, but the Phenom 9550 was definitely the bottleneck of this benchmark. After Minecraft, I tried to play some Counter-Strike Global Offensive, and the results were honestly better than I expected. For some reason, MSI Afterburner decided not to work with this game, so I used the Steam in-game frame rate overlay and therefore can't provide an accurate representation of what the true average frame rate would be. But with all the lowest settings applied, the game ran well and the frame rate was, for the most part, consistently between 60 and 80 FPS. So even in competitive, the game would run just fine on a computer of this stature. Since that test ran so well, I then attempted to play some Rust on the computer. I knew this test would go poorly since the system was under the minimum requirements, but I expected the frame rate to be a bit higher than the 22 FPS average that it achieved. During testing, all the hardware such as the GPU, CPU, and memory saw significant utilization mostly ranging from 80 to 95%. To run Rust well on this computer, you would need quite a few upgrades to the system, and with the limitation of the power supply plus the cost of better parts, the revamp would prove quite expensive. The last, more modern game I ran on this computer was Beam and G Drive. With all the lowest settings applied, the average frame was only 15 FPS, and that was pretty terrible. However, after toggling on simplified collision physics, the average frame rate skyrocketed to an excellent 71 FPS. Although the V5800 saw high utilization during gameplay testing, the 9550 was still the biggest bottleneck of the system, and a significant processor upgrade would be required to run the game in a decent frame rate with the normal collision physics. But I decided to give the build a bit of a break and let it run an older title, Borderlands 2. This game was released back in 2012, a few years after 
all the system components, but it still ran with all the highest settings applied. Here, a trend became apparent that would prove consistent with a lot of these older titles that when I would change the game settings, the game would just crash or freeze. However, after restarting the game and messing around a bit, the average frame rate came to be a decent 35 FPS. It wasn't exactly a high frame rate, but it was consistently stable, and overall, the game ran pretty well. From here, I started working my way back in time in terms of the game release dates and booted up some Portal 2 from back in 2011. Portal 2 is a pretty easy game to run, so I cranked up all the settings to their highest and got an average of 86 FPS. Additionally, both the CPU and GPU saw very high utilization while running the game, so there was no outstanding bottleneck. Afterwards, I went back to a slightly older title in Just Cause 2 from 2010. This title was ran with all the highest settings applied, but in this benchmark, the GPU turned out to be the weakest link in the system. Going back to 2009, I then played another Valve title, Left 4 Dead 2. Once again, I ran this game with all the highest settings applied, and the game ran great. The average frame rate was a solid 91 FPS, but I did only benchmark the opening level, so worse performance should be expected in later game settings. However, the game will probably run just fine in those later game situations, as the performance now is quite good. The final title I played on this system was also the oldest, as well as the best performing, Half-Life 2 from back in 2004. As expected, even with all the highest settings, the game ran great and achieved the only triple digit result from today's benchmarking with an average frame rate of 182 FPS. So yeah, I took an old office type pre-built computer from the recycling, threw some better computer hardware into the system, and it was actually able to run games at a decent frame rate. The good part about this build is that it still had a lot of potential since the Aspen Pen motherboard supports a variety of processors and up to 16GB of RAM. Officially, the best CPU that I can fit to the system would be the Phenom X4 9950 which shows for about $30 on eBay and would warrant about an 11% increase in performance. But on a few forms, and sort of semi-unofficially I guess, there was a BIOS update that allows it to support many more processors, the best being the Phenom to X4 965 running at 3.4 GHz. The BIOS version required to do this is version 5.13 and the one currently installed on the computer is version 5.05. So hypothetically I could update it and if I swapped out the current CPU for the Phenom 2 in question could see up to a 31% increase in performance according to user benchmark which I really want to do. However I can't really justify spending $30 on some old CPU at the moment but to change my mind you can hit that red subscribe button below, leave a like and or leave a comment. It's free you should do it. And one last thing I'd like to touch upon in this video is that the Phenom processor wasn't always the bottleneck of the system, but that the Fire Pro V500 was sometimes a limiting factor. Realistically, I'm at the limit of the power supply and therefore can't install any of the better graphics cards that I currently have in stock without ripping a power supply out of another working system. I mean, I might do it, but I probably only will if I buy the Phenom 2 X4965. In terms of the future of this computer, I was actually thinking of making a sort of laptop out of it. Granted, it would be a 5-6 to six inch thick monstrosity, but I think it'd be fun to make it nonetheless. If you have any video ideas, put them in the comments section below, I'd like to hear them. And one last thing before before you go, would you like exclusive videos and unreleased footage with a behind the scenes look into this channel? Well, then join the Discord, link in description. Regardless, thanks for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. Also, please leave a comment below because interactions with viewers will help boost this video in the YouTube algorithm and I guarantee that I'll respond to your comments. While you're at it, please subscribe because it helps a lot in video quality and production and also positively affects my day. Finally, leave any questions or suggestions in the comments below and have a great day. Bye!